In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, this is a reading and an occasion that we rarely get to celebrate on Sunday. Most of our familiarity with the story uh, comes from the very last part of the Christmas pageant. You know, the time when the shepherds have realized that somebody entrusted them with big sticks um, in church uh, and are starting to uh, execute that power that they have. The angels are starting to realize that the wings are bumping against one another and halos are at about half tilt. Uh, and if we have a live baby Jesus, uh, he's starting to, or she is starting to make herself uh, known to the congregation as well. And at that point, uh, we start playing We Three Kings, and at the appropriate time, each king comes uh, and lays uh, their gift before that uh, now wailing Christ child. Uh, <laughs> so maybe it doesn't get our undivided attention the way it should. Uh, and it's a reading that is so beautiful. Uh, even more than its historical veracity or ability to, uh, to prove and quantify that this happened exactly the way it is documented in the story and history, it proves its truth uh, by its sheer beauty, the way that it all works together. And it's worth taking the time to uh, open it up a little bit. Uh, but before I do, I want you to think of this uh, element from Celtic spirituality. It's a little bit like our uh, three-legged stool. In the Anglican Church, we have this idea that we have a three-legged stool, that our ability to gauge whether this is of God uh, comes from our ability to find uh, that truth in Scripture, uh, to engage uh, tradition, is this the way that the church has understood this to be true? Uh, and then that sense of reason, uh, that sixth sense that we have, or uh, our cognitive abilities and all those God-given gifts, when we put all of those together, does this seem to be of God or the way that God is directing us as a person, as a church? Um, is this true and real? Uh, the Celtic uh, spirituality element of that is uh, understood in the sense of two books that our understanding and our responsibility as people of God uh, are to read thoroughly two books. The large book is all creation. From that gospel from last Sunday, that first chapter of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and all things came into being through Him. And not one thing came into being that was not of God. That when we study creation like a book, we know God. We understand God, we see God, uh, and we understand God's ways. And the second, uh, only physically smaller book, is a far more intimate way of knowing God. In the experience of God and humanity in Holy Scriptures. And by reading these two books, we learn what is of God and what we are called to do as people of God. And how we are called to look at the world and see God in it. Think of that... Um, pedagogy or way of thinking as you look at the way the different people in, these, uh, uh, in this story play out. So this is the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. In the first chapter of Matthew, and as I uh, teach our third graders in, uh, in our scripture class, it is the, and I'm amazed lightning hasn't struck me yet, it is the worst beginning of any book that expects to get published uh, in, uh, in all of history. It begins with an entire chapter, page uh, plus, of begets. Jim begets Bob, begets Steve, begets Simon, begets, and it keeps going and going and going, and by the time nobody is paying attention, the story gets good. You know, uh, but it's meant to tell you that this is part of what the people of Israel have been waiting centuries for. This is the promise uh, that has kept people going, that has been part of families' uh, stories passed on through generation through generation, that from the stump of Jesse, from the father of David, a Messiah will come that will change the world forever. Just wait. God will act again. And so after all of the begets, there's the story of a woman, barely a woman, Mary, having a child with Joseph. And then the very next thing, in this very Jewish gospel, written to very Jewish people, is something from the other side of the world. Now, the shepherds uh, have their symbolism in Luke and, and, and uh, wonderfully uh, show how things have been turned upside down. Uh, but in Matthew, they're turned upside down in a different way. There is a breaking open. 
and from half the world away. People who are studying that one book, the big book, who understand God through reverberations throughout all creation, have noticed that something so profound has happened in the world that creation has been altered forever. The stars aren't where they normally are. Something new is happening in the world, and they study enough to be so convinced of this truth that they load up everything and hit the road. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the, uh, uh, the wise men or the three kings, um, we know just what I just read. Um, we know pretty definitively they probably weren't kings. In fact, um, the story is much like Luke is being turned upside down. Um, they may have worked for a king. They may have been philosophers inside the king's court uh, that were called to, uh, uh, to study the stars and science and be able to give wisdom uh, to a king. They may have been uh, independently uh, uh, contractors uh, that, that used those skills uh, for their own profit. Uh, but we're pretty sure they're not kings. They're philosophers, astrologers, uh, intellectuals of their day, uh, but something in that compels them to go. And we don't know whether the king, when they told the king what they'd seen, sent them, or whether uh, they decided not to sing their, send their underlings because they thought this was so profound, uh, so world-changing that they wanted to see for themselves. Um, we don't even know how many of them they are. We know there's three gifts, and uh, since there's the number of verses and, and uh, we three kings, and we want to send one down during the myrrh and one during the gold and one during the frankincense, uh, we, we have three kings, um, or magi, uh, but there could have been hundreds, there could have been two. Uh, all we know is that they brought three gifts. Um, and so they traveled uh, far, and they were following this star that was shining in the night sky uh, that settled right over Bethlehem. Uh, and my wife will tell you, I have no sense of direction, absolutely none. Um, but I looked this up on Google Maps, and they believe that the, uh, the Magi came from either Iran or some even uh, speculate as far as China. Uh, but there is no direct line where you run into Jerusalem before you get to Bethlehem. Um, so they detoured. They were following the star, and they thought, the king of kings is born. Where should we go find the king? And they stopped looking at that book long enough to say, you know what, probably the palace. So they went to the palace. They went to Jerusalem instead of Bethlehem. And when they got to uh, Jerusalem, they went to the palace uh, and they met King Herod, who was uh, one of the more uh, tyrannical kings put in place by Rome uh, to watch over uh, uh, Israel. Uh, during his prime, he was tyrannical. As he got older, he got a lot meaner. Uh, he actually killed a spouse uh, and several children uh, because of a paranoia that they were trying to get his throne. Caesar said it is safer in his county to be a pig uh, than to be a child of his. Um, he was known far and wide uh, as developing a profound sense of paranoia over people trying to usurp his power. So when these three, uh, three, uh, wise men show up and say, we're looking for the new king. We heard the king was born. Uh, you can imagine his fear. He is trembling. Uh, this is his worst fear, realized that somebody is coming to take his power. But you know what I never heard before, despite all the pageants, and despite all of the readings of it that uh, struck me this time? It wasn't just that Herod was afraid. The line goes, and Herod was terrified, and all of Jerusalem with him. Why are they terrified? This is what they've been waiting for, not just in their lifetime, but in lifetimes of lifetimes. This is what they've been waiting for, and it is being realized. And one, they don't even see it in the sky. Um, they are so locked into that one book that they're not looking at the other book. Uh, and two, they are struck with fear. What if God has acted? What does that mean for how I'm living my life? It promises change. Even the most glorious change takes us from where we are and takes us to somewhere new. And that's scary, terrifying. And so they were terrified. And so um, Herod goes in, uh, shaking, goes in and gathers uh, his wisdom team, uh, his think tank, and says, uh, what should we do? Where is this to take place? And they all, of course, knew, uh, knew like the back of their hand uh, that the promise was uh, that God would act and a child would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, the, 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 the city of David. And so he tells them, 
as he composes himself and walks back out to the wise men and says, Bethlehem, why don't you go and search diligently, find that child, that beloved child, uh, that king of kings, uh, and come back to me so that I can come uh, and worship him just like you. And so they go and they find the child. I can only imagine what the experience was like of finding the child, uh, even beyond the narrative uh, that they didn't even know. They saw God in this child. They knew this was profound, that this was life-altering, and they brought these gifts. Look at the significance of the gifts. They brought gold for a king, frankincense, myrrh, uh, for healing, and for his impending death. And then they left by another way. They left by another way. Think about all the things colliding here in this moment. Uh, and they said that they worshipped him. They didn't say that they uh, paid homage. That's the English translation. Uh, the real word is that they worshipped him in a way that's reserved for the one true living God. They worshipped him. Think of the response that God in the flesh manifests. Worship and adoration and hostility. Think of what we know sitting in this pew uh, that will bring us back here in four or five months. Worship and hostility. That as God becomes flesh, the God who will be king, God who will heal, will be God who will be killed. And all of that is wrapped together in this pregnant moment of these people who never heard the story coming from half a world away because all creation, the big book, has been altered forever. So what do we do? I think the richness of this story calls us to three different questions. The question we've been asking all during Advent, if God is coming, where are we called to go to meet him? See how far the Magi traveled. Where are we called to meet God? And as God's own people are terrified and refuse to look at the sky, what keeps us, what keeps us from opening ourselves to the possibility of God being born in our hearts, of God being alive in our lives? What gets in the way? What terrifies us? And third, when we've encountered the living God, when God has manifest God's self in our lives, how does that change us? How do we leave by a different road? How do we walk out of here in a different direction? Amen.